Well, if we haven't met before, I'm Pastor Andrew. I'm a senior pastor here, and I want to tell you this. We believe in uh, looking and seeing what is God doing in people's lives. Uh, if you weren't at the business meeting, then you wouldn't have heard that uh, Danny Settle has uh, decided he's a shift in direction of his uh, career path, and we voted to uh, make him a, a license to minister. And so we're just really excited about what God's doing in Danny's life. But as well, I had a question asked to me, uh, there was a couple that, that came from, from New Zealand and they asked me, uh, does your church believe in the equality of women? And I'm like, yeah, we do, we really do. She says, okay, I'm just wondering about that. And when I watch you as a church, I wonder, what are the gifts that God has given you? And uh, at Christmas time, I, I, I'd seen Rahama and she gave her a Christmas speech and I was moved. And I, and I was moved not just in my heart, but in my spirit to say, you know, Rahama, if the Lord lays something in your heart and you'd like to have my pulpit, I will give it to you in a heartbeat. Well, she took me up on it and I am so thrilled. And I'm gonna ask Rahama to come here and uh, I'm gonna make sure she's got this. The handheld mic. And uh, we are just so thrilled to see what God is doing this young lady. Um, you have a wonderful gift and we are just Looking forward to being blessed by you this morning, and you have as much time as you need, and we're just going to have a little prayer with you here before we begin. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Rahama. We thank you for the word that you've placed in her spirit. Lord, help us have ears to hear what you're going to say through this young lady this morning. Lord, we thank you that you have anointed her to speak and to share your word with us today. We pray all these things in your wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> I'm very thankful to God and all the pastors and the leaders, rather the whole church, for giving me this opportunity to glorify God's name through sharing the words. So today's topic is, Our God is a Living God. And today's scripture is from the letter of Paul to Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and onwards. It says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is a challenge of God's favor over our lives. It tells of the surety of God's hand on our lives. It's a surety of God's, of God's mercy on our lives, of God's love for our lives. When we speak about today's scripture, it states, if God is for us, who can be against us? This is a statement of faith. When we further meditate on this verse, it starts with if. We need to think or ask ourselves a question. Is God with us? And are we with God? If God is for us, no one can be against us. But if God is not for us, who is with us? With God, we can challenge the whole world. But without God, we're nothing even for a moment. We believe in a God who is almighty, who is all powerful, the God of the impossible, the Lord of the lords, the king of the kings, the master, the creator, the healer, the wonderful counselor. He is our protector, our strength and our shield. He is the healer. He is our savior who is unlimited who is omnipotent, who is omnipresent. And Bible tells us that His eyes are watching over us, over our decisions, our characters, our privacies, our actions. Rather, according to Psalms 139, nothing is hidden from Him. Again, if God is for me, who is against me? The Word of God says that God loves us because he made us in love he loves everyone likewise he loves both righteous and unrighteous the sun shines on both righteous and unrighteous this is a fact 
that he loves everyone. And the other fact is that he's not with everyone. He loves everyone, but he's not with everyone. There's a big difference in children and others. There's a big difference in children and relatives. There's a big difference in children and friends. If I see my life an example, being a daughter, I can go to my father anytime. I can claim my rights. I ask and sometimes force him to fulfill my needs and desires. <laughs> but a child from neighborhood cannot do this. An outsider does not have any right over my father. Yet, he loves them and shows kindness to them, but he's not with them. He's with me. And I believe, and he will stand with me in every situation I face. And he has given me authority over many things. Then what about our Heavenly Father? Who is the Father of the fathers? We call him our Father who art in heaven. Through Christ, we have the right to call him Father. We have the right to go in his presence anytime, anywhere. We have the right to claim things in Jesus' name. And we have the authority in Jesus' name. Luke 10, 19 says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. And nothing will harm you. There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is power in his name. His name is the sweetest name, the most powerful name, the authoritative name. The name that is above all the other names. And when we pray in Jesus' name, sick receive healing, demons flee, and miracles manifest. Acts 3, 6 says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple, and a man crippled from birth at the temple's gate begged them. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them attention. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I don't have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he got up and walked. We church are blessed to have his name. We are blessed to have his promise. Matthew 28, 19 says, And surely I am with you always till the end of age. This promise is for his people. In Revelation 3.20, we see the word of God says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice let the, and opens the door, I will come into him and he with me. This verse tells us that God is waiting for us to open our hearts. He's waiting for us that when will we allow him to come in us? For example, if you take an empty bottle and close the lid and put it in an ocean, will the water go in? No. Unless we open the lid and let the water go in, the water will not go in. As we learn that God is present everywhere. His glory is everywhere. But sometimes we remain empty because we keep lids in our lives which stops the blessings and power of God to come in our lives. His river of blessing is flowing for us, but we need to open our mouth to fill in with him. Psalms 81.10 says, Open wide your mouth, and I will fill it. We are blessed here with so many facilities, freedom, but in Pakistan, People's lives are at high risks, but without any facilities, churches remain full. They know that they could be bombed or burnt any time, but they go to church. Sometimes in winter, without heaters, small children shiver but sit in the presence of the Lord. In summer, there's no fans, no air conditioning, but they sit in the presence of the Lord. It's no different in Sri Lanka. It's the same. No facilities, but the churches are full. Even early morning at 6 a.m., I saw people standing at the door and deeply worshiping God. Where are we here? 
We have so much freedom and facilities. But are we honoring God the way He deserves? Are we honoring God? He has a great plan for us. Plans to prosper us. Plans to bless us. Plans to give us hope and a bright future. The only thing we need to do is remove the lid. That lid can be any bad habit. Money, situations, lust, adultery. Anything against the word of God or anything that is being given the first priority in our lives. It stops the glory of God from entering our lives. We are church and Jesus is our head, not tail or bottom. He deserves the honor and respect of fed always. Being church, it is our responsibility to shine for His glory. It's our responsibility to show Christ through our lives and to tell the world that Jesus is alive. When we read 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 to 40, we see when Elijah challenged the 450 prophets of Baal. The God who answers by fire will be the living God. He told them to select an ox and cut it and offer it to Baal. And then he would take an ox, cut it and sacrifice it to his God. And whosoever, whosoever God answers by fire will be the living God. So the prophets of Baal took an ox and prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until afternoon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no answer. And then it came about at noon when Elijah mocked them, saying, Call out with a loud voice, for he's a God. Either he's occupied or he's on a journey or he's sleeping. And what do you think they did? They cried louder and even cut themselves with swords and lances. But there was no answer. Then, in the evening, Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down, and took 12 stones according to the numbers of tribes of the sons of Jacob. Then Elijah arranged the wood and cut the ox in and put it on the wood. And then he asked the people, to fill four pitchers of water and pour the water on the woods and in the trench. And he told them to do this twice more. So it was 12 pitchers of water on the wood and in the trench. And he did this so that there was no doubt left that his God was a living God. Then Elijah said, O oh God, the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today, let it be known that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and I have done all these things in your name. Answer me, O Lord, that this people may know that you are God. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the dust and the wood and the stones and licked up the water that was in the trench. We need to repair the altars at our homes. We need to set prayer altars at our houses and our lives and offer our lives to God as a living sacrifice. In 2 Samuel 5.19, we see when David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? He inquired of the Lord. He said, Shall I go? Are you coming with me? Because he knew that he was nothing without his God. He knew that if his God was not with him, he could not do anything. He would be defeated. The same way in Exodus thirty-three fifteen, Moses said to God, saying, If your presence does not go with us, do not stand up from here. Because he knew that if his God was for him, no one could be against him. But if his God was not for him, who was with him? No one was with him. Mean, likewise, when we read Daniel chapter 6, we see that King Darius appointed 120 satraps and three administrators over them. 
and one of them was Daniel. And later, when the king planned to set Daniel over in charge of the whole kingdom, so, so the satraps and administrators started to feel jealous, and they started to find grounds of charges against him, but they could not find any. Unless it was something to do with the, the law of his God. So they made a plan and went to the king and insisted him to, to issue an edict that anyone who prays to any other god will be put to the lion's den. And, and Daniel learned about it and he went to his room and prayed to God per his routine three times a day. He went to his room and opened the window which opened towards Jerusalem. And he prayed to his own God. He did not worship the king. So the, the administrators went to the king and they said, Daniel's not worshiping you. He's worshiping his own God. You have to put him in the lion's den. Now, the king, understanding the conspiracy, wanted to save Daniel. But he could not because he had issued a dict. He, people thought that Daniel was being prospered because of the king. But the king knew that Daniel was being prospered because his God was with him. Because his God did not leave him nor forsake him. Because when he knew that, because when his God was with him, no one could be against him. So the, king, so the king had to throw Daniel into the lion's den. So while throwing Daniel into the den, the king said to him, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you himself. Then the king returned to his palace and could not sleep. He did not eat and no entertainment was brought to him and his sleep fled from him. The next day he arose at dawn and went to the lion's den and called out to Daniel, saying, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, saying, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouth of the lions, and they have not hurt him, Amen. because I was found innocent in God's sight. And no wound was found on Daniel because he had trusted his God. Just like Elijah, he had the assurity that if his God was with him, no one could be against him. He had the assurity that his God will not leave him nor forsake him. He had the assurity that his God will protect him. We have to trust our God. Exodus 14:14 14, 14 states that the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And when our God is fighting for us, we don't have to worry about anything. When we give our battles to God, he is there to fight for us. Exodus 3:14 says, God said, "I am who I am," and we say, that he is the great I am. God further continues his words by fulfilling your needs with your solution like he says, I am your healer, I am your savior, I am the bread of life, I am the door, I am your keeper, I am your shelter, I am your provider, I am your counselor, I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the true wine. I am your health. I am your wealth. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and life. Whatever you need, just say, God, you are my everything. Because when he can give his only son for you, why will he not give all the other things for you? We just have to trust him and have faith in him with love. Once there was a man who was a nominal Christian. He never prayed, never read the Bible. Rather, he was living a, leading a sinful life. And he was a servant of the army colonel. And the colonel's mother was so sick 
that she was, she was near the stage of death. The colonel tried the best treatment for her, but nothing seemed to work. Now, the colonel had heard that when Christians pray, God heals. So he went to his servant, who was a Christian man, and asked him to pray for his mother. Now, the, Christ, the Christian man was ashamed because he had never prayed before, never read the Bible. He didn't know God. So he, so he asked the colonel for some time and went to his room and prayed to God. He said, God, I only know you're God, but I don't know anything about you. Prayer or healing, please forgive my sins and give me the grace to pray. He surrendered his life to God and prayed for the colonel's mother. And he was, he was so embarrassed and so, and he, he had the fear of the colonel that he was shivering. And he asked the colonel for, for, a, for a leave and he went home and he was sick. And after some days when he came back, there was a big crowd gathered around the colonel's home. He was scared. He thought that maybe the colonel's mother died because he had prayed for her. And he took fearful steps towards the colonel's home. And the cur when the colonel saw him, he hugged him tightly. He was shocked that why is he hugging me? Like, I prayed for his mother and she died. So, and the colonel told him that my mother is healed because you prayed for us. Today, if you look at ourselves, are we ready to pray for, us, for someone else? What if someone at our schools, at our jobs, anywhere, what if someone asks us to pray for them? Are we ready to pray for them? Are we carrying God's anointing in us to pray for them? Are we, are we worthy to pray for them? Why do you think God answered a, a, a person's man who had never prayed before? God answered his prayer because he had surrendered because God likes surrendered hearts and because he had repented God's word says if you confess your sins I am right and just to forgive you God likes surrendered hearts we need to surrender ourselves to God our God is a prayer answering God who is ready to listen but we're not ready to tell him he is ready to answer, but we're not ready to ask. When we cry unto the Lord, He leaves the heavens and comes to save us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son for us, so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He took the initiative by giving His Son we imagine many things in life. We imagine our future. We imagine, we imagine what, we, what we would get for Christmas. We imagine what we would be, get for our birthdays. We imagine a lot of su stuff. But do, can we imagine the stripes of Jesus which pulled out the flesh from his bones which were for us? Can we imagine the, the cross that Jesus took? Can we imagine the crown of thrones that Jesus took which was for us? Can we feel the pain of Jesus? If we do so, we will realize that the cost that was paid for me and each and every one of you. Today, God is calling you. He wants to be with us always, yet he wants us to be with him. Please remove the lids in your, in your lives and let his river of blessings flow in your life. Let's be a witness of Christ and save someone from hell. But before we do that, we need to save ourselves. We need to surrender ourselves to God. Always remember, if God is for us, who can be against us? Let, I, want, I want to pray with you guys. You can feel free to pray. You can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, you can bow. I don't care how you pray. I just want you to pray. Because the word of God says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, Now the Lord is a spirit. And where the spirit is, there is freedom. I want you all to pray. I want you to surrender yourselves to God. I want, I want you to ask God to be with you. Let's pray. Hello.
Hallelujah. Father, I glorify your name. I honor your name. I'm thankful because you are with us. I'm thankful because your word has promised us that if you are with us, no one can be against us. You are a God who answers by fire. Answer us by fire today in Jesus' name. God, be with us. Acclaim, proclaim, declare, and decree the glory, the mercy, the favor, the grace of God, and all the promises of blessings, safety, protection, healing, prosperity, written in the word of God in Jesus' name. God, I'm thankful that you are with us. I'm thankful that you did not leave us or you haven't forsaken us. I'm thankful that you have given us the privilege to call you Father. I'm thankful that you have given us the privilege to come to your presence anytime, anywhere. Father, we pray that you will bless us. You will bless your people. You will fill them with your glory, with your Holy Spirit, with your anointing, with your power, your authority. We pray that people will live their lives for you. We pray that people will offer their lives as a living sacrifice for you. And, we, and God, we, and we pray that you have given us the strength to pray for our nation. And we claim Canada for Christ. We claim Canada for Christ in Jesus' name. We claim Canada for Christ. God, remember your promise which says, I will be with you till the end of age. We claim your promises for us. God, we, be with us till the end of age. Be with us. Don't take us anywhere if you're not going with us. Because without you, we are nothing. Without you, we are, we are nothing. We cannot do anything without you. Because you are our identity. You are, you are our father. Without you, we cannot do anything. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Rahama. That's really a challenging message. I know for myself, I... The image of the jar surrounded by the ocean of God's love. And I just want my own life surrendered and I want that jar unlated. Thank you for that message. It touched my heart. <sighs> She'll be back. <laughs> you know, we don't know what all the Lord has in store for Rahama or her family, but we know that the Nazir family is a gift from God to our congregation, and we're excited to be for you to be part of our church family. But there's other people here, you know, we've had a convention meeting last Thursday, and, and in the future, going forward, you know, we're going to be short pastors in our convention. And we need to train up and disciple and encourage and love on those whom we see a gift in uh, for the gospel, uh, preaching the gospel. And I don't know what the Lord has, but... You know, we want to make room for people to uh, experience and share God.